Welcome to Chatham House. I'm Leslie Vinjamori, Director of the U.S. and Americas Program here, um, and I am delighted and thrilled to be hosting um, and chairing this panel on U.S. and NATO responses uh, to the conflict in Ukraine. Of course, I'm not thrilled, and none of us are, and I think we're all quite startled um, and at some level in despair, although working very hard uh, as a result of the crisis in Ukraine. It's difficult to believe that it has been, I think, two weeks tomorrow since Russia's uh, invasion, um, which was for many people um, pre predicted um, and, and many people saw it coming. We were just discussing this and, and others, I think, as much as the intelligence was communicated clearly, were, were quite shocked, um, if not surprised, when it actually happened. Um, our panel today uh, is on the record. And I am uh, especially honored to be welcoming two um, such distinguished expert um, speakers who have had deep experience uh, in policy, directly relevant, of course, to all of us. They are in great demand because the consequences um, for policy are, are so sharp right now. Uh, and so their contributions are, um, are very, very welcome. And, and as you can see from the remarkable turnout today, Michelle, Flournoy and Jamie Shea, we are delighted that you're here. Um, for those of you who don't know Michelle and Jamie, I'm sure you all know of them. Michelle Flournoy uh, is co-founder and managing partner at West Exec Advisors. She was from 2009 to 2012, the US Under Secretary of Defense for Policy um, and was previously CEO of the think tank Center for New American Security, uh, which she co-founded. Um, and Michelle, you've been really um, gracious in also speaking to us uh, just over a year ago, I believe, or even less. Um, <clears throat> so thank you for coming back to Chatham House. Jamie Shea, in addition to many things, is an associate fellow on the International Security Program here at Chatham House. So he is one of us. He was, as you know, 38 years on the international staff at NATO. Uh, and his most recent post before finishing was as Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Emerging Security Challenges. So here we are uh, almost two weeks in, uh, two million refugees, I believe, by the latest count have left Ukraine. Um, the conflict continues. I think we've been struck with a few exceptions by the tremendous degree of Western unity. We've also been um, become aware of, of Russia's relative weakness uh, but a continuing war, which we first noted was about a violation of sovereignty. And now I think we're very much fixated on war crimes, civilian atrocities, but also the very challenging tension uh, between deterring the conflict and managing the prospect of a very unwanted and unwelcome escalation. Uh, so with that, Michelle, let me turn it over to you. Um, I have personally really valued your contributions on CNN and on many panels, and it's really wonderful uh, that you can that you can speak with us today. We'll listen to Michelle and then Jamie. We are on the record and we'll come straight to all of you uh, for questions. Michelle. Well, Leslie and Robin and the whole Chatham House team, it's great to be back with you. Let me just start with some takeaways from what we've seen so far from the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I think it's clear that Putin's plan A, which was the rapid encircling of Kyiv to depose President Zelensky, install a Moscow friendly government, that plan failed. And he is now in the process of adjusting his approach. I think we've been seeing surprising, some military analysts would say shocking underperformance by the Russian military and truly inspiring performance from the Ukrainian forces and Ukrainian people. Putin is now sort of focusing in on what I would describe as a medieval style uh, siege approach, um, encircling cities, cutting off food, energy, heating, water, really trying to break the will of the Ukrainian people to continue the fight. I unfortunately do think this is going to get worse. Um, many more civilian casualties, much bloodier before it gets better. But ultimately, my assessment is that Russia is not going to be able to achieve any kind of sustainable success militarily. But by the same token, Ukrainians will not have enough force to be able to fully repel or expel the Russians. So we, I think we are you know, looking at a month's, if not longer, conflict. It's going to get very ugly. And it's, I think, eventually going to transition into an insurgency. Um, it's, uh, it, you know, we'll see in the coming days how uh, 
Russia performs, there's now an open debate in US military circles about whether they actually have the cap capacity and capability to encircle and take and hold uh, Kyiv. Um, but in the process already, Putin has really achieved, uh, succeeded in achieving his worst nightmare, which is NATO is now more united thanks to him. There are more forces deployed along the border, frontline states of NATO, uh, thanks to him. And there's a huge motivation and support uh, unity across the alliance. Um, we've seen the most severe sanctions ever uh, imposed and we're not finished yet. Uh, and I think they'll have a very dis destructive effect on the Russian economy. We've already seen it on the ruble, the market, um, and so forth. I think Putin has made himself an international pariah for the remainder of his days. Um, in the long term, I believe this will be seen as a strategic blunder, an overreach by Russia, um, even though in the near to midterm, Russia is going to have some tactical gains and create tragic, tragic costs for, for Ukraine. Casualties on the Russian side, even by, by the deflated official count, which is usually about half of the what it actually is, those are already higher um, than we would have thought and the most since the second campaign in Chechnya. Um, it's still right now very difficult to see how this ends. Um, the Russians and the Ukrainians are miles apart in terms of their objectives and negotiating positions. And Putin is clearly doubling down on a bad strategy. Um, but I think the Ukrainians feel at this point that they're doing well, that they don't well enough that they don't have to negotiate. Russia continues to demand recognition of Crimea as part of Russia, Donbas as independent, and, new, and Ukraine's neutrality vis-a-vis neutrality -vis NATO and the EU. And again, those are non-starters non for Zelensky and Ukraine at this point. Um, so what now? Um, I think having uh, failed at plan A, um, we're now seeing Russia's language uh, focus on about taking all of Ukraine, quote, denazifying the country, which is absurd, <laughs> and, but are really subjugating uh, and erasing the Ukrainian nation state. Again, we don't think they have the military capability to actually hold all of Ukraine. There are already protests that are happening in quote unquote held or occupied areas, but the presence of Russian troops does not mean that Russia actually controls the area. Um, we assess that Russia probably has about three weeks to fight at this tempo. After that, they will need a ceasefire in order to resupply uh, and reconstitute units. Um, and then the conflict will continue after that. Um, again, Putin is likely to double down, continue to pursue his maximalist objectives until he himself is convinced that he can't win on the battlefield. But we're very far away from that. Um, the, uh, in terms of the risk of es escalation, um, which was mentioned, um, Russia can still escalate inside U Ukraine militarily. They are using about 90% of the forces that they had amassed on the border, um, but they have not used air power to the extent many had expected. A lot of their, the damage done to cities is being done by artillery, mortars, rockets, and so forth. Um, so it's possible they could really ramp up the air campaign against population centers. Um, there's also um, con uh, the, the continued risk of escalation if Putin gets increasingly frustrated with Western and NATO efforts to arm the Ukrainians. The potential for Russia to try to hit convoys while they're coming across the border and potentially miscalculating hitting them inside NATO territory, that risk is there. In addition, when you have two militaries up against each other in such close proximity with NATO air policing operations on one side and, and the Russian Air Force on the other, right now they're not uh, flying much in Western Ukraine, but if and when they do move there, you could have real potential for some kind of accident or incident uh, and that could lead to miscalculation and escalation. I also don't think we've seen Putin's response to the sanctions yet. If he's going to use his traditional playbook and as the sanctions bite, we can expect him to launch major cyber attacks against the US and NATO countries, um, going after critical infrastructure um, and uh, you know, use, you know, unleashing 
criminal elements to use ransomware uh, and, and so forth. Um, uh, and then ultimately, if there is some, you know, miscalculation that brings, uh, that creates a NATO dimension to the conflict, then we've already heard Putin put the nuclear um, uh, option or the nuclear threat on the table. Um, I don't think it's likely. I, I don't think it's, I, I think it's more bluster at this point than not, but, but it's the nuclear shadow is always going to be there um, when we're talking about Russia, given its doctrine of escalating to de-escalate. Um, and last point I want to just touch on, or maybe two, uh, if I have time, um, Russian discontent. Um, you know, these sanctions are extremely punishing on the average Russian. Um, and I think they're likely to get worse as additional banks, possibly Spurbank is added to the sanctions list, which will cause more, even more economic pain. Um, I think that, you know, we've also seen, uh, you know, we've seen domestic protests. We've seen some degree of opposition among, uh, you know, those around Putin. You've had Abramovich, you know, selling the net, uh, Chelsea uh, the football team and offering to provide the net proceeds to Ukraine. You've had Luke Oil coming out against the war. Um, you know, I think, I think it's a very remote chance that Putin loses his power in this scenario, but it's not impossible. You know, when you think back in time, in history, when have authoritarian leaders fallen? It's when you have a combination of popular discontent um, and elite uh, discontent. And so again, I don't think it's likely, but it's not impossible, particularly if he continues to double down on a strategy that neither his oligarchs nor his, the people uh, really support. Um, and, and, and they will continue ex experiencing increasing pain. The last thing I just wanna to touch on um, is a brief word about China. I think, I think uh, President Xi's support of Putin uh, was predicated on the assumption, uh, an assumption that proved faulty, that there, you know, that this would be a quick operation, that it's an opportunity to divide the U.S. and Europe, um, that it was an opportunity to um, sort of bolster the marriage of convenience with Moscow. Um, Chinese certainly wanted to see a di more divided Europe and a split with the United States, um, but that's not how it's playing out. So I think. Um, I think we can expect for now President Xi to try to soften the blow of the sanctions through purchases of commodities from Russia, um, as well as possible some, possibly some workarounds on some of the financial sanctions. But the jury is really still out uh, as to how supportive he will continue to be, particularly um, if this continues to go badly for Putin. It's also the jury's out on what lessons he derives from this experience. Um, he has to be looking at Ukraine and wondering what does this mean for Taiwan? And I have just made returned from a trip to Taiwan that the White House asked several of us to make to reassure them. Happy to talk about that in the Q&A if, if, um, if desired. So let me stop there and turn it back over. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Um, I will come back to you with one question before we open it up, but let me first immediately um, come to, to Jamie Shea. Uh, well, uh, Leslie, thank you for, first of all, for inviting me. Uh, and let me also uh, thank Robin, because I can see him directly in front of me on the camera, uh, for giving me the opportunity to be an associate fellow. Uh, for most of the time, it's the pleasurable experience of being able to sort of tune into these fantastic chat and webinar as a listener occasionally obviously robin you're right uh, you have to sort of sing for your supper and accept to perform as well so uh, i willingly do this today and i'm really really honored and i mean that uh, with no uh, false uh, uh, protocol here uh, to be able to share the platform with michelle um she also made uh, many of the points that i would like to make so i'm going to try not to make them again uh, because i wouldn't make them as elegantly uh, and to sort of focus on maybe the nato side of the uh, ledger now michelle rightly said that uh, in a way the Ukraine crisis has performed the ultimate trick of pulling the allies uh, closer together, maybe than they've ever been before, in much the same way as one of the early NATO Secretary Generals, Paul Ari Spak, once said that every village in Belgium should erect a statue to Joseph Stalin uh, as the fear factor that had pulled the allies together uh, then. Yes, it's true that fear uh, unites. But that said, uh, I think we also need to remember that uh, NATO was already pretty united 
united uh, after russia annexed crimea uh, in 2014 and many of the sort of you know heightened readiness deployment of forces to the east uh, revising defense and contingency plans all of those things that we're still talking about today were already then set in train uh, after 2014 the enhanced forward uh, presence um, the larger exercises the military mobility and reinforcement strategies so i think what we're seeing today is not if you like a massive new departure but it's very much an acceleration and an intensification of what we were seeing already uh, since 2014. The second thing is that I think, honestly, if you approached uh, your average NATO ambassador uh, and said, Mr. or Mrs. Permrep, uh, would you rather have a slightly less united NATO but be back a year ago in a situation where we do not now face this massive Russian challenge on our borders and we don't have this catastrophe or nightmare of a Russian Russian invasion of Ukraine? Uh, I think most ambassadors would have said, yes, uh, we, we, prefer, we would prefer to be there rather than where we are today. Yes, NATO is united, but obviously with massive, massive challenges to face. On the good news front, um, you're right, uh, in a couple of weeks, Putin has uh, uh, reunited, uh, reignited the debate in Sweden and Finland on whether to join NATO. He's made the Danes decide to have a referendum in June on removing their opt-out from EU defence. Uh, he's had the Germans commit to 2%. I never believed I'd ever see that in my lifetime uh, of their GDP on defence with a, a supplementary budget of 100 billion uh, euros for the modernization of the Bundeswehr. Uh, he's moved Poland to 3% of GDP, Romania yesterday to 2.5, Latvia yesterday to 2.5 GDP. Uh, and the bigger, biggest effort we have of NATO rearmament that we have seen for many uh, uh, generations. Uh, that's absolutely uh, uh, true. Um, and initially, yes, uh, NATO has functioned well. Uh, President Macron, I don't think, would be uh, entitled to call NATO brain dead, as he said back in 2019. Uh, the Biden administration, I think, has done a fantastic job of engaging the European allies. Uh, Kamala Harris is making her second trip to Europe in two weeks after Munich, uh, traveling to Poland and Romania today. Uh, Tony Blinken, I've, I've lost count, frankly, of the number of trips that he's made to Europe. He finished the last one in Paris uh, yesterday. Uh, we've had all of the senior uh, US uh, national security officials uh, consulting the European allies. There's been a fantastic job of keeping everybody uh, on board, not only for joint sanctions, but even when we're going in slightly different ways, like with oil, which the Biden administration and the UK decided to sanction yesterday. The Europeans are not quite ready to go there, but even where we're of having a differentiated approach. It's still a united approach in the sense that we're doing it in a coordinated uh, uh, fashion. Also, for those skeptics uh, uh, coming out of the Trump years of the health of the transatlantic relationship, uh, at least in security terms, uh, the fact of the matter is, is the United States has deployed more troops on a temporary basis uh, to provide reassurance in Central and Eastern Europe than all of the other European allies put together, about 15,000. And it's moving the, Europe, uh, the US presence in Europe uh, back up towards the 100,000 mark with modern aircraft, with elements of the 82nd Airborne, with the obviously uh, very strident reaffirmation that Tony Blinken gave, again gave yesterday, of the American commitment to Article 5. So America has shown that when push comes to shove, it, it, its ability to reinforce Europe and its readiness to do it are as sacrosanct as they uh, ever were. And, and we've seen a whole flurry. I mean, I can't give everybody the shopping list. It would take me too long uh, of other Europeans who have agreed to send additional forces uh, to uh, Eastern Europe to provide that element of uh, uh, a reassurance. Looking to the more me medium term, I, I think there are going to be three big challenges, of course, that NATO is going to have to face. Number one is how many of those temporary deployments does NATO now try to make permanent? Um, when Tony Blinken was in the Baltic States, of course, they asked for all of those additional US reinforcements to stay and to stay forever, or at least for a very long time, or to be rotated much more uh, uh, gradually. So does NATO now, as it moves towards its summit in Madrid in June and its new strategic concept, move away from uh, its current posture, which is based on a relatively light presence in Central and Eastern Europe with the capacity for uh, warning time and quick mobility and moving forces back? Or does it now go towards a much more Cold War posture uh, of heavy armoured brigades or even divisions, uh, which would be forward uh, deployed? 
what is necessary because clearly you know there's always as people on this call know a big difference between deterrence what you need to convince an opponent that you are going to resist and you're willing to fight uh with more to come later and defense which is the ability to beat an opponent within 48 hours on the battlefield on the day of the attack and of course uh, the eastern european allies quite rightly will take advantage of this crisis to move the cursor of, of, as much from deterrence towards defense as deterrence as they possibly can. What is this going to require in terms of standing forces? And what would be the impact, for example, on the United States or other allies uh, in terms of their ability to engage elsewhere in the world if they, they now have to park a much higher percentage of their force structure permanently in Europe? It's obviously going to be expensive. The other issue, of course, concerns Germany. To what extent, uh, now that the Germans are prepared to move to 2% and invest in the modern of the Bundeswehr, to what extent will they be uh, uh, heavy armoured units that are going to be required for taking some of the uh, United uh, States? So to are interested working on European heavy armoured solutions with France and the other European allies, which could also, by the way, be a way of reassuring their EU partners uh, as Germany increases its military uh, uh, profile. Poland, for example, has shown uh, some interest uh, in working with Germany on this kind of uh, a construct. So that's issue number one. You know, uh, and again, now, how does NATO have to adapt things like exercises um, and uh, uh, training and so on uh, to, uh, as Michel quite rightly said, a, a Russian military, which whatever the outcome of the Ukrainian crisis is going to be much more ensconced in Belarus and probably parts of Ukraine for some considerable time to come, thereby uh, uh, reducing NATO's warning time and increasing the possibility of incidents, of course, as these uh, forces exercise uh, in the Black Sea, in the Baltics, in much greater uh, proximity uh, to uh, each uh, other. Um, the, 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 the second issue is to what extent will allies work according to a plan established by the Supreme Allied Commander Europe. Uh, what we've seen at the moment is fantastic. It, it's uh, everybody sort of sending forces wherever they want, uh, not working, however, according to a NATO consolidated war fighting plan. It, it's all a bit ad hoc. Um, and uh, as NATO moves forward, I think it's very important that all of these different contributions be consolidated under a SACA theater driven plan so that units know where they're going to go if push comes to shove, which particular Russian unit they may have to fight against and where and, and, and how in terms of pre-assigned duties. This is not something which NATO militaries have had since the end of the Cold War when wanting to have total flexibility over their forces, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, NATO, they haven't given them pre-assigned uh, mission. So we need to work according to uh, a coherent uh, NATO uh, uh, plan. I think the third issue, uh, which is uh, going to be uh, a, an, an important one uh, for, for the Allies, is to know when is Putin, when does Putin consider that he is truly at war? Uh, with the alliance. We're now in a gray area where we're at war uh, in the sense that you know, we're assisting Ukraine and we're opposing Putin and we're imposing sanctions and we're enforcing NATO um, and we're even figuring out how to get MiG-29s uh, at the moment uh, into uh, Ukraine. Uh, the Poles obviously would like this to be done through NATO to give them some strategic cover. Uh, other allies are rather nervous about that. So we're now in this gray zone where we're at, where we're at war, but we're not at war, uh, at least not officially, but how does Putin see the threshold of when he considers that he is effectively at war for NATO, uh, with NATO, and may be potentially prepared to uh, escalate? In other words, we are going to have to have a very intelligence-driven set of assumptions uh, in NATO, much better than the assumptions that we had about the Putin regime prior to 2014, about how Putin is going to react to the kind of things that NATO is now going to have to do to have a solid uh, uh, conventional defense with, of course, much more focus, as Michel rightly said, uh, on the functionality of nuclear deterrence, particularly if Putin is tempted to try to launch a nuclear weapon as some kind of demonstration shot to intimidate NATO. What is he capable of doing and how do we anticipate that uh, and work to deter it, but in a way that makes it very clear in terms of messaging what NATO is all about? I think NATO has done a very good job so far, and I don't say this simply because I used to be at NATO. Jamie Shea would say this, wouldn't he? No, I think NATO has done a pretty effective job 
job in, in setting down the red lines, in being predictable in terms of what it's prepared to do and what's not prepared to do. It hasn't wanted to play into the Putin playbook uh, of NATO being a contributing factor to this particular crisis. But I think the demands on, on keeping that up are going to be greater now as we go forward with obviously a, a, a regime in Russia, as Michelle rightly said, which is going to be increasingly under pressure, increasingly on the back foot of potential failure and a strategic defeat and increasing, therefore, increasingly perhaps willing to uh, lash out. I mean, at the very least, I think, uh, in terms of what Michelle was talking about, deconfliction mechanisms uh, with the Russian army. And one exists already that the Supreme Allied Commander has maintained with General Gerasimov for many years now, even meeting uh, occasionally in Kazakhstan to exchange information on, on exercises and so forth. Just like the US established a deconfliction mechanism with the, the Russians in Syria, we may need something similar to make sure that messages are clearly conveyed, uh, particularly, as I said, as the degree of military activity in close proximity uh, uh, works up. Uh, a related issue, of course, concerns European strategic autonomy and what the EU has been planning to do, particularly led by the Macron presidency in France at the moment towards ramping up its own uh, military capabilities and, and, and forces and you know, a European EU sort of entry force and, and so on. The battle groups already exist. To what extent now these EU strategic autonomy plans with all the variated capability development, uh, which were originally designed to go to Africa or uh, in areas of the world uh, beyond collective defense, can now increasingly be tied into NATO's collective defense effort, just like uh, taking up what Michelle was saying about uh, Russia responding with aggressive cyber attacks uh, against NATO and, and hybrid tactics we've seen already. To what degree NATO and the EU can partner in intelligence sharing and cyber defense and critical infrastructure defense and transport link defense and all of these kinds of things to be able to respond uh, uh, to that. Uh, second issue very briefly is, is help to Ukraine. Um, we learned in Afghanistan, of course, that you can train the wrong army uh, for a fight that it's not able to sustain, particularly without uh, the NATO and US enablers. And I think as we go forward uh, uh, in terms of assistance to Ukraine, NATO has already ruled out a no-fly zone. And I think quite rightly, I, I, I buy those arguments. It's going to be very, very important that we see how NATO allies can assist without necessarily getting NATO involved in the conflict. The problem here is you're going to have to do enough to be effective, but with always the risk that by doing enough of being effective, you become party pre in the conflict itself. I think one important thing is going to be adaptability to the kind of resistance that the Ukrainians are able uh, to uh, uh, sustain. Um, for example, today, I think there was a good decision here in the UK uh, with the Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace, announcing that the UK will give Star Streak uh, man pad shoulder held anti-aircraft weapons to the Ukrainians because uh, uh, air defence has been an area where they've been quite effective up until now and uh, maintaining uh, uh, resistance means not allowing the Russians to have total control of airspace. Uh, we got that wrong in Afghanistan where we didn't adapt the army to the conditions uh, and the circumstances where it was able to fight uh, by itself and I think we need to do a much better job uh, modeling the assistance to what the Ukrainian resistance can effectively use uh, uh, best as we Jamie, go I'm gonna, I, well. think, I, I think I'm going to have you pause here because I want to make sure before we come to questions I want to get Michelle um, in here to respond to some of your remarks uh, before we come to the audience, but I'll also ask you one concrete question, Michelle, which is, um, you know, how much further do you imagine the U.S. response going, uh, apart from these longer term issues um, about NATO's forces and deployments? Uh, is there something that might happen on the ground that would trigger the U.S. to go beyond the red lines that it's so far drawn? either with respect to no-fly zones, are there additional sanctions being considered? Are there other measures? And also, could you say something uh, about the extent to which you can say um, there are concrete proposals and plans uh, under discussion for you know, so-called off-ramps in any kind of negotiation? So I do think there are additional sanctions options that are, you know, have been considered and have been put off for the future, but could come, um, adding banks that uh, affect the Russian population more, broad, more broadly um, and deeply, like Spurbank, where you know, it's where people have their mortgages and their ATM cards and their savings accounts. 
Um, so the, the economic sanctions can certainly be increased by adding more entities to the list. I think there's also a pretty robust discussion of secondary sanctions to try to prevent others from uh, trading with Russia, helping Russia. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and they're always looking at additional people to identify with the regime and add to the, the, uh, the list. So I, I do think that's there. I also think so far the US has been very restrained from what I understand in its use of cyber operations. Um, but I think if Putin really unleashed major attacks on US critical infrastructure, that could change. Um, and, but I think the administration, I just wanna, I completely agree. I think they've handled this masterfully from the rapid declassification of intelligence to set the facts, deny Putin you know, the ability to mis sort of mislead people with a false narrative and false provocation, manufactured provocations and so forth. That's been brilliant. The extent of the diplomatic consultation and so forth. But also I think the discipline and the restraint in terms of really trying to make sure this doesn't trigger a broader European war with NATO and Russia directly in conflict with the risk of nuclear escalation um, and just a, a much even more catastrophic you know, set of circumstances. So um, in terms of how this ends, I, I think the, um, we, I, this came up in some conversations um, over the weekend and, and I think the you know, folks uh, inside government are just starting to try to wrestle with this of how how could they hasten the point of stalemate? How could they set the table for some kind of more productive negotiation than what they've had so far or what they've seen so far? Um, and how do you give Putin a way of backing down or, or declaring victory or having some kind of face-saving way of, of pulling back from both the campaign and his, some of his more maximalist objectives? but I think it's early days. Thank you. Um, let me come uh, to David Manning. And just a reminder to, to everybody that we are on the record, so your questions will be recorded. Well, thank you very much, Leslie. I wasn't expecting you to come to me at this point, but I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful too to our speakers, admirable. I, what I'd like to do, if I may, is take Michelle's offer up on, on what she found to be the mood in Taiwan and what the read across is, she thinks there may be between uh, China and this crisis. And in particular, do, does she think that uh, Beijing will look at this and think uh, we better get on and do Taiwan or is it the reverse? Uh, will they be so surprised by the degree of Western cohesion and the extremely competent way in which the United States has managed this crisis and, and think that perhaps they better revise their, their plans for Taiwan. Yeah. So I think right now in Taiwan, you have the Chinese all, all over Taiwanese social media amplifying the message of, you know, today Ukraine, tomorrow Taiwan. Basically, there's no purpose, there's no possibility that you could resist successfully defend yourself. So why don't you just give up now, accept reunification on our terms and, you know, end this fantasy that you that you could be independent or you could be sovereign or you could defend yourself. So um, that's the current sort of approach from China to Taiwan. I think President Tsai has done a really masterful job of actually saying, look, if you want to draw parallels to Ukraine, look at how Ukrainians are resisting and, and, and messaging her population, if we invest in our own defense, if we invest in our reserves, if we have a new civilian mobilization agency, if we make that a reality, you know, when you resist, when you fight for your freedoms and your democracy, that is when the international community comes to your help to support you. And so she's trying to use it as a moment to mobilize her own population to pay more attention to resilience and defense and so forth. But I think that your, your fundamental question about what does she really take from this um, I think with the jury's out. I think if Putin is ultimately seen as successful, um, she may be in, you know, encouraged to uh, 
to think more um, about using his military option. I'm in the camp that believes this is not gonna happen anytime soon. His focus between now and the 20th party Congress is stability being made chairman for life. And, and then after that, he'll turn to his legacy, but that even then China's preferred approach with Taiwan is not military. It, it really is like, you know, if you're a Star Trek fan, it's absorption into the board, you know, political and economic coercion to absorb. Um, but it doesn't mean it's, uh, I think it's on the table if those efforts don't succeed. But if Putin is truly made a pariah, if the sanctions are incredibly destructive to the Russian economy, if he doesn't succeed in, in Ukraine, I think that will be a cautionary tale for Xi about don't assume that your forces will fight as well as they, you know, fight as well as they look, you know, as they look, be as good as they look on paper. You know, don't assume that you won't encounter resistance. Don't assume that the international community won't be unified and very forward leaning in its response uh, and willingness to impose costs. So I think the jury's out, though. We have we we have to see how this how this plays out. Jamie, would you like to add to that, or shall I come to a few more questions and then back to you? Go ahead. No, uh, Michelle has been in Taiwan. I haven't been in there for for, for many years, but I think uh, just off the top of my head, I, I think the Ukraine has showed uh, that you know, the, the, there's a degree of popular resistance that can bog things down. Um, and, and so uh, looking at uh, military plans where Putin clearly has been overconfident, I think that's one thing that President Z would probably do. He'd want to sort of question his army much more intensively about the feasibility of, 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 of the plan. Uh, secondly, of course, yes, the effectiveness of sanctions indeed. And of course, the issue too is that if China gives a great deal of support to Russia over the next few months, uh, which of course Putin, as Michelle said earlier, would uh, gratefully uh, 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 like to have have in you know uh, gas sales of uh, financial help and so on to what degree will then the, the west the united states have to hit china with secondary sanctions vis-a-vis uh, -vis russia as well so uh you know to some degree i think uh, for the time being uh, what's happening uh in ukraine makes a chinese uh, uh, move against taiwan at least in the short run less likely rather than more likely but i defer michelle to the fact that you've been there very recently I'm going to come to Peter Westmacott, Robin Niblett, and Elena Lazarou. I'll take those three together. Um, Peter. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. And uh, thank you both, Michelle and Jamie. Tremendous presentations. Uh, uh, rather cheekily, I'm going to ask if I may uh, two questions. Uh, the first is about the UK, if you like. I think there's a lot of some satisfaction here in Britain that despite Brexit, the United Kingdom is nevertheless still able to play something. Uh, of a significant international role in responding to a major international crisis. And I think that that's uh, appreciated. The two political aspects of this, which generate the most headlines, one is what's the UK doing to show that it's uh, being helpful towards refugees? And the other is what's the UK doing to address the, the problem, to take the rather unkind shorthand of Russia being a laundromat for Russian oligarchs. Now, legislation is going through the British Parliament, and there's a lot of talk about seizing assets and so on. But my question is really just to ask, does punishing or seizing the assets of or ostracizing, sanctioning one way or another, oligarchs who are President Putin's enablers make a difference to him? Is it a meaningful means of bringing pressure on him to think again uh, about the mistakes that he's made? Or is this really just about um, making people feel better about having a bash at those people who have got very rich with President Putin over the last few years. And my second question is about Turkey. Turkey's been playing an interesting role in all this. They closed the straits to Russian warships after a number of them had, ships had gone through, but nevertheless, they did it. They condemned the invasion of Ukraine in pretty unequivocal terms. Um, now they are seeking to play something of a diplomatic role. One or two envoys have been secretly in Turkey, and the two foreign ministers of Russia and of Ukraine are going to meet in Antalya uh, later this week. Um, but Turkey, meanwhile, is hugely dependent on Russia for sources of oil and gas. I'm hearing that rather than interrupting those supplies, they're choosing to put the payments for those oil and gas exports in an escrow account, so they're not actually financing the war. But my question really, is to ask whether the, the role, which I'm sure a lot of people in Turkey would regard as pivotal, or the at least significant role that President Erdogan is playing, is in any way altering the perception within the rest of NATO and in Washington 
about the importance of Turkey as a regional player in NATO at this time of international crisis. Thanks. Two really big questions, but I'm still going to come to Robin. Wonderful to see you, Michelle. Thank you very much for joining us, Jamie. Uh, great to have you with us again. Um, just a couple of points, but I'll be very quick on them and, and let you decide if you want to and how you want to answer them. Michelle, you said that um, Putin has become an international pariah. I think there's a lot of observation over here as to whether he might be a pariah in quote unquote the West. And clearly you have some allies in the Asia Pacific who've stepped up on this. But from Imran Khan's visit through to some of the ambiguity in the Gulf, uh, through to plenty of uh, uh, commentary from Africa to ASEAN, um, there's a lot of the world who just think this is not our fight. This is an old Cold War hangover. And I'm just wondering how uh, you know, Washington is able to manage that dynamic, given that everything has to be brought to bear. And then the broader comment for both of you about how we and what's the near-term goal and how do you calibrate your military engagement? It strikes me that a minimum near-term objective has to be that Western Ukraine remains entirely free. And maybe that's a way of trying to calibrate the kind of military support that's provided and everything behind it, is that you know at least a part of it needs to remain uh, with space for uh, the Ukrainian government to exist, act, uh, and not simply be under siege. Uh, and how one calibrates military supplies and military support to secure at least that interim objective without stating it publicly strikes me as quite important, but just ideas for you to consider. Thank you very much. Why don't we take those two and then we'll come to Elena. Um, Michelle? Sure. Um, you know, I think um, you're right, Peter, to raise the question of how effective is sanctioning oligarchs, because in the past it hasn't worked as well as we'd hoped. I think what's different this time is the um, degree of popular discontent that we're seeing in Russia, um, whether it's people not supporting the war because of their own ties to Ukraine, not understanding why are we doing this, whether it's mothers who are now receiving those casualties back from the front, um, whether it is Russians who are feeling the economic effects, and that's again likely to get worse. But when you have the combination of some degree of popular disconsent or unhappiness, and you have oligarchs that are starting to question whether Putin's really pursuing what's best for the country, those things can feed off each other. And, and again, I don't think it's likely, but it's, it at least creates the possibility of some move to uh, either change Putin's behavior pressure him to change behavior or even to remove him. Um, and so I do think that, you know, in that context, it's worth continuing to, to, to put pressure on these folks. Um, I think, you know, Turkey's role, it's really interesting. You didn't mention the, their supplying of drones. One of, it's a really key um, thing that they've, they've given the Ukrainians and the Ukrainians have been using them very, very effectively. Um, and I think that's gained a lot of appreciation in the US and among other NATO allies. Um, and so, you know, I think right now, Turkey is playing the role of a very good NATO partner. And, um, and so I think there's a, you know, appreciation um, for that. Um, uh, Robin, to your point about um, Russia not being a pride to everyone. Yes, of course, that's true. You know, Russia has a real chokehold on some countries, you know, I was talking to someone who, you know, from uh, India who was saying, you know, that their entire, you know, military along the line of control with China depends on Russian spare parts, right? You know, they, they are so dependent still from their history on uh, Russia for um, military equipment and spare parts that they have to be very careful in terms of how they, they navigate and what they do here. And I think a number of countries can, you know, either are dependent on whether it's for military items, whether it's for energy, whether it's for commodities, um, you know, and that's something to work on longer term to reduce those dependencies um, and reduce those vulnerabilities. Um, and then in terms of the objective of a, a calibrating, you know, I agree with you. I think we want to try to ensure that the 
Ukrainian resistance and the military has what they need to try to prevent um, Russian forces from really occupying Western Ukraine. I, I think right now the focus should be on preventing them from actually being able to encircle Kyiv. Because I think the whole question of where, when this Russian force will culminate and run out of gas. Um, another thing that it was mentioned to me is not only are they having all the logistical and morale problems and defection problems, which we could certainly do things to help along. Um, the, uh, they're due for a big, big uh, rotation of all the conscripts in April. So what happens to those conscripts when they're stuck in Ukraine? They were told they're going on an exercise. They didn't, not that they were going to war. They may have family or sympathies or at least have no desire to be in Ukraine. And now their term is up. Are they gonna stay and fight? Are they gonna walk? What are they gonna do? So I think Russia is in for a very challenging period of keeping this force moving and effective and, and so forth. So I think the, the first thing we gotta really focus on, and this is why we've just sent in so many javelins and stingers and other other like um, munitions is to, to try to prevent the actual encirclement of Kyiv. Jamie. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks. On, on, on Turkey, yes, as Michelle said, Erdogan has tried to mediate. In fact, uh, as I speak, uh, the Antalya Diplomatic Forum is kicking off, uh, and Lavrov, uh, his first trip outside Russia for a while, uh, is meeting uh, Kuleva, the uh, Ukrainian foreign minister, for talks, and uh, you know, that's the highest level sort of talks that we've seen so far under Turkish auspices, and it's going to be very interesting to see you know, what they come up with. You know, Russia has sort of announced its war aims, if I can put it that way, you know, in terms of demilitarization of Ukraine, in terms of you know, giving up the uh, um, prospect of, of, of NATO uh, membership. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, is that something that the you know, Ukrainians are going to be prepared to negotiate uh, on? So far, probably not, but uh, Turkey certainly is, is playing that role. I agree also with what was said about the, uh, uh, the uh, drones. In fact, before the war, Turkey had even offered to build a plant in Ukraine to manufacture those drones. Uh, they're proved effective so far in, uh, in attacking uh, convoys. Uh, and maybe, you know, when we're looking right away at, at aircraft of MiG-29, which are very visible when you try to get them into Ukraine. And it's very difficult to say that you are not involved uh, in the conflict uh, if you try to put those planes in. Drones are something which uh, are much less visible, much easier to smuggle across borders at night in small quantities. Uh, the Ukrainians know how to manage the, the TB2s, the Turkish the back to TB2 Turkish drones. So maybe that is something that could be, uh, you know, apart from the imbrogolia of the MiG-29s, so that we should focus our uh, efforts uh, on. On the other hand, Erdogan has not imposed the sanctions. Uh, and Michelle's right, maybe, you know, that could have disadvantages in Turkey still having one foot in the Western camp, one foot out. Maybe it could have advantages if effectively Erdogan, with the confidence of both sides, can put pressure on Putin and, and make the case uh, in the way that the Chinese don't seem willing to do at the moment on Putin, that it's time to climb down. Um, when it comes to uh, Western Ukraine, yes, uh, I, I think the key thing is to avoid uh, what the Russians want in terms of regime change, keep the current government in, in power. Uh, it's the focal point of the Ukrainian resistance if President Zelensky is forced to flee the country, let alone it were he to be assassinated by Russian special forces. You know, you need a symbol if you're going to maintain resistance and maintaining that government on the spot as Zelensky has brilliantly done, keeping Kiev alive, I, I think is key. Um, I think uh, uh, we're going to see the Russians uh, basically focus on the southern part of Ukraine. That's where they seem to be making the effort at the moment out of Crimea. Uh, the land bridge, of course, uh, to, uh, to Crimea, taking away possession of the Black Sea uh, coast. Uh, that, of course, uh, would make Ukraine pay in terms of its export capacity, the loss of the Sea of Azov. It's already lost, of course, since 2014. It's uh, gas uh, drilling platforms in the Black Sea, given the Russians greater control control of the Black Sea. I think that's probably the most damaging scenario to the long run uh, for Ukraine as a functioning economy. Um, uh, but, but at least it does mean that the, the, the Russians probably would be less concerned uh, trying to capture Western uh, Ukraine. But we don't want a partition of the country. Uh, and I think you know, one of the things that we're going to need to think about is not sort of off-ramps only for Putin, uh, 
you know, would we sort of not indict him for war crimes uh, so that we don't push him into a corner? Or would we indict him for war crimes? You know, the ICC is now open in investigation as a way of further ostracizing him, the prior word that Michel used in the international community. I think we're going to have to look at the sort of tactics we use vis-a-vis -vis the Russian uh, elite over the next few months, but we are going to have to think about different scenarios for Ukraine and uh, what is the least messy sort of outcome uh, in this period that we're going to be uh, in as well. UK and refugees. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the key thing is that Boris Johnson you know, says, you know, post-Brexit, you know, we voted to leave the European Union in order to control migration, and that applies, unfortunately, to refugees from Ukraine as much as to anybody else, and we need checks. Okay, but if you then make the argument you need checks, then you've got to actually implement the checks in an effective way, and sending just a couple of officials to Calais uh, as a surge capability, you know, to process uh, visas for you, those Ukrainians who've got that far, asking them to go to Paris or to go to Brussels or elsewhere, where, uh, you know, no, I mean, if it's if that's the idea, then set up the system in Poland, set up the system in Moldova, set up the system in Romania or on the border, send the people to effectively do that kind of job. Uh, and then the whole process would have a certain degree of, of credibility. London, uh, London grad, Londonistan, Lord Ramat, it's probably good that the UK is using this to clean up uh, 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 the London Stock Exchange and London Financial Services not just against Russia, but any kind of dirty money. Uh, and uh, in a way, I think this is probably going to be healthy for the viability of London as a financial centre in the future. Uh, uh, and maybe this has been the much needed, uh, 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 if you like, pressure to clean up the act, uh, which is good, of course, in terms of putting sanctions on the oligarchs and others uh, in terms of the current crisis, but which is probably good for the reputation of London uh, as a financial centre as it competes with Wall Street and Frankfurt and other centers, Singapore, uh, in the uh, uh, future. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll just le leave it uh, at that for now. Thank you. I'm going to come to Elena Lazarou, Mark Malik Brown, um, and Andrew Payne. I think we probably will only have time for those three questions. Uh, there are a very large number of questions. I know Robin has to leave for an offsite meeting uh, at six. He's been very grateful, he said in the chat as we all are, but let me come to you, uh, Elena, and then to Mark, and then to Andy. Bye, Robin. Thank you very much, Leslie. Um, this is fascinating. As much as one listens to things about Ukraine these days, it never stops being interesting and, and, and very tragic. Um, under normal circumstances, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the big questions of the future, such as what do we need to think about when we think about the future of deterrence and Russia on the UN Security Council, or what will that look like after, after now? But for this, for the purposes of this, this panel, I'll ask a very precise question, which is Belarus. Um, it's been used by Putin. We have, I think, if intelligence that is widely available is true, there are more troops amassing in the southwest of Belarus. So to what degree is Belarus strategic to Putin? And in that sense, to what degree should a US European transatlantic re response also focus more on isolating Lukashenko? And since that's a regional element, perhaps you could say a couple of words about Moldova and Georgia and building resilience, uh, deterring further expansion of Putin's aggression to, to those countries. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie, and thank you to both our speakers. Um, look, just think long term for a moment. Let's assume that this, this thing does get bogged down in Ukraine with some sort of standoff of semi-Russian occupation but continued resistance. I'd love to hear from you both how long you think uh, we can continue to isolate uh, Russia economically, politically. Is it an indefinite exclusion? And does that kind of potential for conflict uh, if we are, as we will be, I'm sure, supporting and arming uh, any resistance, long-term resistance to Russia? Is it likely to spill into a wider conflict? And the final part to it, the sort of economic impact of all of this, you know, two of the world's top grain producers are at war with each other. We've seen the impact on energy prices. I mean, this could have really consequences for the global economy, which I wonder whether policymakers in Washington and elsewhere have sufficiently factored in to their longer term strategies on this. 
Thank you, and, and Andy, and I will say that I know Michelle has a very hard stop at six. So we will aim to finish at six. So um, a final question from Andy, and then you can sort of pick and choose uh, as you wish, Michelle and Jamie, to, to reply. Uh, Andy Payne. Thanks, Leslie. I'll, I'll be quick. Um, in some sense, I want to throw a question that Jamie raised back at Michelle um, about the, the temporary deployments to Europe and the pressure to make those permanent. And my question is, to, to what extent does the US have, A, the capabilities, some of which are fungible across the theatre, some of which are not, and B, the bandwidth to, to do that and really to do it all, to guarantee European security, confront residual threats in the Middle East, and as also address the sort of geopolitical threats in Asia, um, observing that the Indo-Pacific strategy was announced on the day that uh, Jack Sullivan came out and said that uh, the invasion of Ukraine was imminent and uh, you know, talk about bad timing. So you, you bear the battle scars of, of managing the Middle East and the pivot to Asia. So interested to hear your thoughts on, on the constraints on strategic adjustment. Sure. Sorry, sorry to you, Michelle and Jamie. I know this is very unfair, but I guess you have about two minutes each. Uh, and, and I have to say, I, I do think um, Belarus's alliance with Russia in this has become is very problematic and we need to focus on um, increasing costs for them as well over time, while also investing in, you know, we threw security cooperation with Moldova, with Georgia and others to make them sort of more, more porcupine-like, more um, difficult to digest for Russia. Uh, frankly, a lot of what we're seeing today on the battlefield with Ukraine is work that we've done with particularly Ukrainian special operations forces and others um, to improve where they were from where they were in 2014 to where they are uh, now. And we've done a ton of work along those lines with the Baltic states as well. Um, on Mark, your question, I think the sanctions are going to be on indefinitely. I mean, you may get some defection on the margins, but I think the US intends this will be a long-term uh, effort as long as it takes. Um, the economic impacts are very real. On the energy side, though, I would just say that I think the administration is making a very concerted effort to look at every possible way to replace the Russian oil that's going to be that is being taken off the market. Um, you know, uh, some news reports of talks with Venezuela, some discussions about uh, you know an Iran deal being close. Uh, the talk of a president going out to see the Saudi leader, uh, the crown prince, to talk about OPEC production. So, you know, we, we will see if some of this can be ameliorated, but you're right. I mean, there are gonna be some, there's a price <laughs> um, of, these, of these long conflicts um, and of Russian aggression. Um, and in terms of the force deployments, I actually think that, um, in terms of heavier ground forces in Europe, I think I, I'm of the view we took too much out before, and I think some may stay in. Um, but if you look at the kind of forces we need for Europe and the kind that we need in the Indo-Pacific, the, the, the center of gravity of each of those is somewhat different. Um, I think the US, given its global interests and its leadership role, has to be able to deter in both of those theater at, while managing um, things like terrorism and other problems that come out of the Middle East. So um, I think that they're currently revising the national security strategy and national defense strategy to make exactly that point more explicitly. Thank you, Michelle. Jamie, about a minute. Uh, my, my one minute up and worth is it, to say on sanctions. I think the, what, what is the good thing this time around, because we all know that sanctions take a long time to work and that governments, you know, think of Iran, think of North Korea, think of you know, Libya under Gaddafi, eventually, you know, find ways to uh, work around. So I think the key thing is to front load, you know, not this gradualist sort of approach, but to put the full package on immediately. And I think, you know, with what we've seen over the last couple of uh, months, you know, with SWIFT, which many people thought would not be part of it but was being part of it uh, uh you know and uh, the all of the other sanctions uh, uh, we've seen that kind of front loading so if these sanctions don't work sanctions won't work uh, uh you know to make the pain uh, apply quickly which uh, of course shakes up the civilian population and gives the the, the, the regime less time to adjust and adapt so that's the good thing uh, the second thing is, is uh, and i've written on this uh, what i call the people's war this time we are 
actually seeing this unprecedented mobilization, you know, Coca-Cola's pulling out, Pepsi's pulling out, Puma's pulling out, you know, the private sector, which is not forced to do these kind of things, you know, even McDonald's is shutting 850 restaurants uh, in, in, in Russia, this unprecedented mobilization of civil society, you know, at NATO, I, I used to stand up and criticize Anonymous for hacking into our website, what do I say now about Anonymous, as it, you know, claims to have hacked into the Russian uh, satellite communication system. You know, th this, this is quite unusual, the way in which all of these different groups, uh, including, by the way, in coping with the refugee situation in Poland, this civil mobilization of civil society behind the war effort, and what can governments do to sustain that, which could also be another very, very, very good way of getting the message inside Russia to Russian civil society about what its regime is doing. Now, again, there could be a downside to this, because if we sort of encourage private hacker groups to sort of go after Putin's military infrastructure, he may confuse that with a state-driven cyber attack in the gray zone, and we could be in trouble. But, but nonetheless, I think this idea of the private sector goes to war and feels not just a corporate social responsibility towards its consumers at home, but towards geopolitics is, is something very new and which may this time around give the sanctions a much better chance of working when they only, like in the past, uh, came from governments. Belarus. The I'm going EU... to stop you there, Jamie, because that um, was actually that was actually a tremendous. Uh, you know, there, there's not a lot of optimism right now, but that was, I think, a really nice note to finish on. I know that Michelle has to leave. I will say that McDonald's pulled out before Starbucks. I think that's important to note for the Americans. <laughs> against us. Um, but I really, I, I appreciate it greatly to all of you, especially to you, Jamie, and especially to you, Michelle. Thank you again for returning to Chatham House. I hope you'll do it again.